flag. The 63rd Daytona 500 is underway. I thought I would mix it up a little bit. We've been doing uh, blast-offs and you know missiles and whatever, so I thought I'd mix it up a little bit, do something different. Today. So, yeah, different. So, speaking of different, I don't know what your political persuasions are. I don't care. <laughs> but if you've been watching the news, there's been all of this talk, all of this talk about voter fraud and election fraud. Uh, maybe I'm sure you've all seen it. I don't know how you feel about it. But this week, this week, there was incontrovertible evidence presented, and people were arrested for voter fraud. Did you know that? Yes, here it is. It's from the New York Times, no less, about voter fraud in Florida. I mean, the outrage. Oh, the humanity. Yeah, and what it was is a mother and her daughter got online and put in over 200 votes for her daughter to become the queen of, you know, the, uh, homecoming. of homecoming. Oh, the outrage. Oh, the humanity. Oh, the pain of it all. Uh, she was arrested. Uh, the mother was arrested. And she's a vice principal or something in a school. And uh, her daughter was put into juvenile detention. But there's another reason we, I know we are at the end of the age, the apocalypse, the end of the world. Technology has taken us over, did you know? Because no longer is it enough. No longer should you go out and buy a toothbrush because you need an internet-enabled toothbrush. You know, here you need a toothbrush that checks out. It has a three-dimensional picture of your mouth. And it tells you, oh, you missed a spot. It replaces your mother. It replaces your dentist. You know, and it's wired to the World Wide Web. So your dentist can sit there and say, oh, naughty, naughty, naughty. Oh, and by the way, my fee just went up because you're missing this spot. And if you're just wondering, oh, well, you know, the value, how much? Well, I want you to know that you can save money because they've brought the price down to $299.99 for a toothbrush. Well, it's not just a toothbrush. It is an internet-enabled smart toothbrush. And I know everybody's going to run right out and buy four of them, giving them to your grandchildren and your nieces and nephews. But one of the things I wanted to talk about because I think about my dentist. Now, I loved, liked my dentist, even though he did pain, but he taught me many important lessons in life. One of the lessons I learned from my dentist was a filling fell out once upon a time. And I thought, oh, I've got this hole in my tooth. I can you feel it with your tongue, you know, when it's sharp. And I've got to do something about it. What should I do to save my teeth? And what are some things you think I should do? Pull a crown on it. Pull it. Put a crown on it. What else might I do? Root canal. I'm sorry, root canal. Right. All of this is wrong because Dr. Gladkowski thought. Well, there's a hole, so let's chew some gum and get it stuck in there, and that'll seal it off, and that'll be good. I see some people are just looking at me and shaking their heads side to side. So I went to the dentist, and he's in there, and he says, what is wrong with you? And he starts with his tools, and he starts picking it out, you know, and there's this strings of gum are coming out. And then he tries to drill in there, and it gets all in his bits. He is not a happy camper, by the way. I learned some new dental terms, which I Googled, and they're like, I thought those were swear words, but eventually they were not. So, you know, I had to look in the back of my mouth. 
And that, you know, there's a difference between what's in the front and what's in the back. There's a difference between what's right in front of us and what's behind us. And so, for example, when you go and watch the Oscars, there is what's in front, or you go to a, a theater, there is what's in front of the stage, right? That's in front, and everything looks what? Wonderful, beautiful, organized, everything is, you know, the people walk out, nobody trips except me, and so, you know, all these things, it's beautiful, but what's backstage? Chaos. Chaos, panic, who knows, you know, things are all over the place, there's a lot of difference between what's in front of the stage and what's in the back of the stage. The same thing is true at a restaurant, when you're in the when you're eating in the restaurant, what is that part called? Dining. The dining. In, in, the, in the people who work there, it's the front of the house. You know, and that's where the food is all there. It's all clean, it's all nice, it's all organized. There, everybody's smiling. But if you go in the back, there is what? Messy. There's messy, there's chaos, there's, you know, food is going everywhere. Chefs throw plates. Oh Did you know that? They get frustrated. You know, uh, servers say they're sending it back again. And, you know, they do things to your food that you don't want to know about. So there's the front and there's the back. The same is true in the music industry. There is, you know, the front, the song, it's what you hear. Remember this album? Some of you, most of you are not old enough to remember this. The Magical Mystery Tour, remember the, this important work, bless you. Uh, in Strawberry Fields Forever, there was this. Did you hear it? I bury Paul. They were hiding messages in the background. I bury Paul. In Star Wars, there's a background message. Only knew the power of the dark side. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am the father. the original script written by George Lucas. You know, we saw the first Star Wars, and you thought, it is this evil, dark Darth Vader. <laughs> you know, and, and then in the middle of the second episode, this bombshell gets dropped. But it was there all the time. It was in the background. It was somewhere in the back story. And there are these threads in literature, there are these threads in music, there are these threads, these messages of life that are in the background. So, you know, we call these things the narrative threads. You know, or these little things, they just sort of float along and they're not important until they come to the front. And when they get to the front, they smack us right in the face. You know, it's, it's really important. It was just this little thing going on in the background. But now it's coming to the front. And now we have to deal with it. And last week, remember, we talked about how the nation of Israel, what did they do? God parted the sea. And what did they do? They walked across on dry land. God dry, not only split the waters, but dried the land. Isn't God good? He didn't have them flog through the mud. And so God, they do this, you know, and they then, you know, we have this, but there's this back story that's been there, but there's only these little pieces. And these pieces, this thread comes up, and God says to Moses, he says, Pharaoh will think. 
Oh, the Israelites are wandering all around the land in confusion. And they are hemmed in by the desert. What do you think it means to be wandering? Kind, trying to find your way, confused, lost, don't know where they're going, aimless. This is a video of, what do you think? Old Faithful. Right. And it sits there and there's no water. And then what happens? It erupts. It erupts. But does it come out like the water from the hose in your, in your yard? No. No. It's Oh, here, back, strong, back. You know, it's all over the place. They're wandering, meaning they're here, they're there. You know, there is, there's no straight line in their life. There's no straight line in their pathway. There's no straight line in their destination. And it says that they are hemmed in. Hemmed in. What does it mean to be hemmed in? Trapped, can't move. Like what? Like a straight jacket. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you've done any sewing in your life. I've done some sewing. Don't laugh. Well, maybe you should laugh. But, you know, to put in a hem means you put in a line of thread and it doesn't move. It's stuck there. And that's where they were. There were, they were stuck. They, you know, think about what George said about Mary and Martha. They are stuck with their brother being dead. dead. There's no way out. There's no escape. There's no, there's no push button. There's no transporter from the Starship Enterprise to get them out of here. There's no trap door on the stage of their life to be take, spirited away. They are hemmed in. They're shut in. They're closed off. They're isolated. There's no way out. Sound like Mary and Martha? Yeah. There's no way out. Dare I say, sound maybe like a little bit like some of our lives. There's no way out. We're trapped. We're hemmed in. And so when the king of Egypt was told, ah, it's just like you thought, his Pharaoh and his officials, what did they do? Changed their mind. They changed their mind. They cha you see this video, what is happening? Pancake. pancake. And what's happening to the pancake? <laughs> They're flipping. It, the pancake is changing its mind. That's what changing our mind means. It means to do a flip-flop. It means, oh, I was over here, now I'm over here. You know, it's not just sitting there. You know, our one son in, our, in Colorado, he has a smoker. Okay, and what do you do with a smoker? Smoke. You smoke, you, put, you, put, you cook, you put the meat in it, and then it... You wait. You wait, thank you. It just sits there. There's no flipping it over. It's not like a grill. It's not like a frying pan. you got to flip that thing. And this, that's what's happening. They flip their wigs. They flip their minds. They change their minds. And it says, we must have, what must we do now? What, you know, what, what was wrong with us? What have we done? They, they start looking backwards and saying, what is wrong with us? You know, here's a picture of a Tesla. And when you go in reverse, Three cameras come on, you see them, and where are they pointed? Backwards. Backwards. Yeah, what have we done? What's behind us? Where was that? You know, we're all looking backwards. Mary and Martha come out to Jesus and say, Jesus, what's up, dude? Where were you? Why, weren't, why didn't you come and fix the problem before it got this bad, because now there is no fixing it. Lazarus, our brother, is dead. dead. He is dead, dead. And these people had studied dead. They knew what dead was, and they had passed the test. Their brother is, death, is dead. They were looking backwards. 
So Pharaoh and his officials now are all looking backwards saying, oh, oh, you know, what happened? And so the Egyptians and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, what did they do? They pursued, which means to chase, to follow after. They went and said, we're going to get these guys. We know where they are. It's simple. We know where they are. Where they are. We're going to ch we're going to go after them, and we're going to overtake them. What's the difference between chasing and overtaking? You caught up with them. You're right there, and what can you do? Do something about it. You can grab them by the scruff of the. You know what the scruff of the neck is. You know. Long before any of you were born, there was a fashion. And I had the, I begged my mother. I begged my, mom, please buy me a shirt with a locker loop. Does anybody remember? You know what a locker loop is? It's on the back of your shirt. It's this little piece of, thread, of material. And it makes a connect so that when you wanted to hang it up in your locker, rather than putting it on you know, a, a hanger, you had this little piece of, of thread, of cloth, and you could just put it on. It was a locker loop, and it was so cool. Oh, I finally had arrived. I had both a bleeding mattress shirt and now I had my locker loop. Don't laugh about the bleeding mattress. And so I had a locker loop. And Linda Henry is chasing me down the hallways of Parkville Junior High because the girls would rip off the locker loops and sew them together as sort of like, you know, people would put trophies. These were how they had their trophies. And I was like, well, Linda's not getting my locker loop because, first of all, if I don't have a locker loop, my cooldom, you know, my cooldom, my level of coolness, you know, plummets, and it might rip the shirt. What am I going to say to my mother? Mom, Linda Henry, you know, it's not my fault. She, she just, you know, she was chasing me. A girl chasing me. Do you know what that's like for? <laughs> you know. Anyway, so, you know, they had reached them where they could overtake them. And God's answer to this, to this panic, you've been there, I've been there, the panic. God's answer is to do what? Don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that you're going to earn. Is that what it says? Stand firm and watch the deliverance that comes from watching three different YouTube no. demonstrations. No. no, it says the demonstration of power of the Lord and the result is you're not going to see these guys ever again. After today, it's over. And so he says this, and so, and why does God do this? God, God just doesn't do this. He says, I have a purpose. My purpose is so that they, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and that I will gain glory through Pharaoh, the chariots, and his horsemen. Gaining glory. I'm going to describe gaining glory to you in a way that you've maybe never heard it this way before. The door is right there. If you don't like it, please make use of it. We like you anyway. Gaining glory is two sides of an equation. Here you'll see a picture of paper mache. This is the paper mache of da Michelangelo's David's face. It's paper. Yeah, anybody ever work with paper mache? What's it like? It's gooey, it's sticky, it's paste. Can you drive your car over it? Can you take a hammer and chisel to it? Well, you can drive over it, and all it will do is go, you know, it crushes. 
But you think about that versus the actual statue, which is made of marble. It's the, what's the difference between paper mache and marble? Marble is solid. It's permanent. It's heavy. You get hit with a piece of marble, you're going to feel it. Somebody throws paper mache at you, and what are you going to do? Huh, is that all you got? You know, so it's different. You know, gaining glory to be considered great. God says, people are going to look at me in a different way after today because I'm going to do something that they're never going to forget. They'll always, you know, paper mache comes and goes. Marble stays the same. I'm going to play a little video of uh, this part of, of the story from the Prince of Egypt. Watch this. like this movie and as we said last week it makes for great entertainment but it's lousy history because the Bible doesn't say this what kept in this movie portrayal what kept the Egyptians from the Israelites fire, fire. fire. yeah Rawr. fire ooh, ooh. you know that's a big thing that's filled with testosterone right it's a big it's a solid it's an exciting thing it doesn't say that it says, then who? The angel, of God. the angel of God, who had been in front of them, withdrew and went behind. And also a what? A pillar of fire? Clouds. clouds. A pillar of clouds. clouds. You know, it's fog. It's, you know, you drive here in Florida in the morning, you get fog. Oh, pff, that's nothing. You turn on the windshield wipers and you go. That's not going to stop anybody, but God's cloud stops them. It comes between them. This cloud is what protects them, not fire. You think about fire. Oh, of course you stay away from fire, but a cloud. God uses the humble, weak things. A cloud's not going to stop anybody, but the cloud of God does. The fog of God is stronger than any fire. It's taller and stronger than any wall. And so this comes behind them. And then what happens? So during this last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar. And, ah, here's the pillar of fire and the cloud. And what does God do? Throws them into confusion. Makes noise. You can't hear it. God uses fire and cloud to separate them. And then God says, that, uh, there's more to me than that. I'm going to throw the enemy, your enemy, my enemy, into confusion. confusion. And what is confusion? Confusion. To make noise. To trouble. To be, it, it causes them to be distracted. He throws them into confusion. This is what the confusion looks like.
I believe you can buy it on Amazon. Yeah. You, yeah, it's available. It's good stuff. So what did happen? He threw them into confusion. And what happened to their wheels? <laughs> they got jammed up. And this is what their wheels, you know, this is 20, in their mind, this is the, their wheels were highly advanced pieces of technology, by the way. And it wasn't just a single piece. It was all of these different pieces on the outside and the inside and the spokes and the hub. You know, it was a very technologically advanced piece and the technology stopped working. What do you do when your technology stops working? You put it down. You boot, you reboot it. You do the three-fingered salute. You know what that is, right? Control-Alt-Delete, right? You know, or you turn it off, you turn it on, you hit the reset, you throw it against the wall. You know, whatever it is, you reach that point of frustration. Imagine the thing that they were depending on, the thing that they were trusting in, got jammed up. But it goes more than just jammed, which means to like to bend. It says they had difficulty. It was hard. The nation of Israel walked through on dry ground. But somehow, what they, when they tried to move, it was heavy. It was difficult. It wasn't quick. They had all of this trouble. And then, so we have God you know, throwing them into distraction, through giving them all of these trouble, bending their wheels, you know, bending their technology, making it difficult. And God says to Moses, stretch out your hand. Why? So the waters can do what? Flow back. Flow back means to return. The water that had been walls on the side is going to turn back. The very thing that saved you is going to be the thing that destroys them. So Moses stretches out his hand and at daybreak, and the Egyptians were doing what? Swimming. They're swimming, yeah. They're actually running into the direction where their demise is coming from. They are running back to save themselves, and God says, there is no way out. I'm coming from where you think safety is, and I'm going to take you down. So, and he says it swept over them and swept them into the sea. It overtook them. It overthrew them. All of their men, all of their technology, all of their leadership, all of their training was gone. gone. It was useless. It was worthless. He stretches out. So the water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen and just covered up a few of the soldiers. How many? The entire army. How many of them survived? None. That's a hundred percent casualty rate. You think about that. On D-Day, the casualty rate was about three and a half percent. The bloodiest day in American history was the Battle of Antietam. That was 18 percent. In one of the skirmishes in the Battle of Antietam, in what is called the cornfield, there were there was one group of people they uh, from Texas. They went in with 226 men. Only 182 of them came out dead. 81%. Horrible, horrific. But what is this? This is 100%. No one was left. You know, we point the finger at Pharaoh and say, na 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 boo boo, you deserved it. You know, you were naughty, naughty, naughty. You know, you had a chance, you had all these opportunities, but what did you do? You hardened your heart. 
And after so many times, God says, if this is what you want, knock yourself out. I'm going to harden your heart too. You know, but I know for me, I can't speak for you. I'm the same way. My selfishness, I try to self-medicate myself to make myself better. And I say, I'm smarter than the average bear. I'm smarter than the doctors. Because on the side of the aspirin bottle or the Aleve bottle or the Tylenol bottle or the, you know, the whatever generic bottle, it says, take how many tablets? Two. Two. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up that said one is good, two is what's prescribed, five must be really good. I became so convinced of this that as a child, I took a bottle, yes, a bottle, of St. Joseph's aspirin for children. And I guess what I did? Just Guess what I did? I chugged the thing. I took it. it. It was like candy. It was so good. I just ate the whole thing. My mother, in a panic, calls Dr. Grot, says, what do I do? And he offered those most insightful words of wisdom that took years of education. And he said, just let him sleep it off. I am not kidding. And I slept it off. We self-medicate. The speed limit says so many miles, says 55 miles an hour. That's made for somebody else. You know, that, that's other people. I am, you know, I got to get there. And, you know, I really know how to drive well. I am skilled. But my biggest skill is I know where the police are going to be. So I will slow down because we go around a curve, or I know that's where they hide, or that's where the cameras are. You know, we self-medicate. Pharaoh had self-medicated himself in the delusion that he was God, and everybody bowed down to him. And he came to the end. Here is a picture of a town of Aku, Ahoku, Japan. Notice where the water is. Notice where that ship is. Notice where the fence is. Watch what happens. See, the force of the water not only took the ship over the edge, took it under the bridge, sunk it. That's March 11th, 2011. Almost 16,000 people died this day. And why? Because water is 800 times more powerful than air. And you can't stand against it. You can't stand against it. But the question is, when there's evil in our lives, there are times we have to stand up to that evil. There comes a time where we have to say, God, I have no power. You must fight the battle. What's the old song? The battle is mine? No, the battle is 
The Lord's, the battle is yours. You are the one who is strong and mighty. I can't figure it out. We've got to be like Gandalf in the first of the three movies about the trilogy. The trilogy. comes a time when we say to evil, you're not going to get through me. But you'll notice, how did it happen? Did Gandalf use his sword? And No. The ground from underneath the evil fell away. God took care of it. How did the Egyptian army was killed? Is it because everybody got up their sword and they went to ninja classes? Uh, no, it was God who took the waters and turned the thing that saved them, he turned it on them and destroyed them. There comes a time when we say, enough is enough. So how do we do this? How do we actually stand for the right? How do we stand against evil? How do we let God do his thing and show and give him, you know, did you hear what George said about the resurrection? Jesus says to the, daughter, the sisters, okay, we're going to go and we're going to lift him up. No, we're going to go and have a prayer meeting. Well, sort of, I'm going to pray. He says, God is going to get the glory so that the Son of God can be glorified. Jesus rose up Lazarus, not to show off, but to give point to God and say, by the way, I am God also. And God does his thing. So where, how can we do this? You know, it says, you know, we need to don't let evil come over us, but conquer evil with good. How do we do this? You know, we lived in Arizona and they have, you know, these saguaro cactus. And let me tell you, you can't get near one of them. You can't. They're prickly. Like anybody you know? No, we won't go there. But God says, I want to take and use the cactus and make it bloom. God can take that awful creature of a saguaro cactus and make it something beautiful. He can make it bloom. And it all takes place at Lowe's. <laughs> yeah, at Lowe's. This week I went to Lowe's to pick up something multiple times, but only once a day this week. And so I walked in, and I'm looking for something in the garden department. Let me just tell you, the garden department, whew, over my head, out of my element, you know, if it's a tool, if it's a pot or a pan or cleanser, I'm there. I'm all in. But gardening stuff, that's dial 1-800-MARY-ANN. You know, so I'm walking in, it's like, where is the thing? I don't know. So what do I do? I'm smart enough to know that I don't know. So I go to ask some help. And I, I'm looking and I, ah, a person, a Lowe's person. So I go over to the Lowe's person. They're behind the uh, cashier in the, in the uh, you know, garden center. And there's a couple there trying to check out. So I'm going to say, I'm going to wait my turn. I'm not going to barge in. And I wait there. And this couple is just crushing the person at the cashier. 
I mean, just, what's wrong with you? We should get these five for five dollars. It's in the flyer. I mean, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? And, you know, just berating her, putting it, oh, it's all. And, and, and this poor cashier is, the, what do I, uh, uh, so she hits the button and calls for help. Somebody comes and explains and says, you know, that was in, you know, and he says, well, it's in the flyer, you know, the Bible of all knowledge, it's in the flyer, you know, and she said, and she said, well, there is no flyer this week. Well, it's in my flyer, and, you know, so they say, well, we don't have a flyer to confirm it, and so the, the, the husband, of course it's the man, I'm a man, turns around, storms off, saying, idiot, but didn't stop there. Good taste prohibits me from repeating his very pictorial and emotional description of what he thought about this person. Now there's evil. I'm going to stand for righteousness. I'm going to stand up and do what is right. So I walked away. <laughs> oh, that's not my job. I'm not, do no, that's not my job. I'm sure there's a camera somewhere that's recording this. You know, that's not my job. And I go off into the electrical department to get the electric tape because that's why I was there. The other thing, out of the garden. And God said to me, I put you there for a reason. You saw that for a reason. How good have I been to you, Chet? Well, God, you've been really good. So what's your response, Chet? Well, I guess I need to be good. Okay, God. Did you ever do that to God? Okay, God. <laughs> so I go looking for the cashier. She's not there. It's like, okay, God, I tried. You know, I really tried, and she's not there. It's not my fault. And there she is. Okay, God. So I walk over to her, and I say, excuse, and I kept my good distance, and I said, excuse me, you don't know me, but I just wanted to tell you what a really nice job you did in handling that abusive customer. I saw it. I listened to it, and I wanted to tell you and thank you for the way you did that. She was overcome. And then another thought came into my head. Okay, God. Excuse me. Where is your supervisor? Would you go get them for me? She runs off comes back and I said to the supervisor, I said, I, you don't hear this enough, but I want to tell you what a great job this person did and retold them the story. It took a few minutes, was a little bit out of my way, but all of us can stand against evil just like that. Some of us are to be like Gandalf and put the stake and say, you shall not pass. And maybe God has or hasn't called you to that. But all of us can fight evil by encouraging and recognizing good. It doesn't matter whether that, those people were Christians. It doesn't matter whether they were white or black or yellow. These are people who are made in the image of God for whom Christ died. These are people to be shown kindness. We are to fight evil. And part of that is through kindness and the love of God. We are also to do away with the yoke of oppression and pointing fingers and malicious talk. You know, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, what? Then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become as the noonday. 
fighting evil, feeding the hungry, standing up for those who have no voice, helping the person who is in trouble. You know, the yoke of oppression, malicious talk. How can you fight malicious talk? Walk away. Walk away. Walk away. Another way is to say it says, excuse me, I say this with all respect, but I'm not the problem and I'm not the solution. I really don't need this. You can do that if you, you know, if you want to. But, you know, and then the work, we are to work for the peace and prosperity of what? The city. Winter Haven, Lake Wales, wherever you are, there are, there are opportunities to work for the peace and prosperity of the cities where we live. It is no mistake wherever it is you're living and we have a way, a responsibility to be supportive. We recently ran into a situation where we needed the police. I happened to, to know some people and they sent some people over and they did a marvelous job. So what do I do? I wrote a letter to the chief of police. I crafted a letter and I named those people. And I said, these men and women of your, that are under your charge did an excellent job. This is how 21st century law enforcement is to be done. It makes us feel safe to know that you have people like this. I. Can I tell you a story? If I could hit pause on the camera, I would maybe. I've never been in a fight in my life. Now, yeah, I wrestled with my brother, but that wasn't a fight. He was 6'4 and 240. He could tie his shoes without bending over. You know, he had no neck. You know, the muscles, he's just rippling. Was that a fight? No. It's a massacre, thank you. <laughs> I've never been in a fight in my life. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. So, if I can't fight, and maybe I'm a little scared to fight, maybe you're a little scared to fight, there's a way to fight evil through encouragement, through recognition. So that's the how, but what's the why? Why are we to do this? Because once we were a people, but now we are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you what? Have received mercy. It's something that's in your pocket. Mercy's already been extended, you know. And this idea of mercy is receiving what was given. Christ died. He gave himself. If you're a Christian, you have received mercy. God's mercy led and compelled Christ to do what? Die for us. Mercy doesn't sit there and say, oh, well, that's just the way it is. I feel bad about it. Mercy is different than that. Mercy, there are like at least five different things. There's pity. You know, okay, there's pain. There's something wrong. You know, it's out there. And then not only is it out there, but I then have, I'm sorry. I see it's hurting you. That's a different level of mercy. And then it says, I feel your pain. You know, empathy. I feel it. I still haven't done anything about it, but I feel it. And then, oh, I want 
to do something. I have a desire to do something. But mercy never stops there. Mercy always, always, always goes on to action. God had mercy on us, and what did he do? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm on the throne of heaven. I've got all knowledge, all power. I know everything from beginning to end. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I'm just going to sit around up here. Is that what he did? No. It says, he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out those other people. It found out me. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary. You feel like Mary and Martha? There's no answer. Jesus understood that they were hurting, but he was compelled to action where he prayed. And think about this. We miss this. Where is Lazarus? He's in the tomb. He's in the grave. He's in the ground. Can they just walk in there and get him out? No. no. Why? Because he's, he's dead. But what's preventing them from going in? There's a stone. stone. How did the stone move? It away. Who rolled it away? It no. Yeah. No. It says they rolled it away. They, the people who saw Jesus wept, weep. They who heard the prayer, they rolled the stone away. It took a community of people, a they, to roll the stone. Now when Jesus rises from the dead, an angel does it. But when Lazarus is dead, Mary and Martha are at sixes and sevens. They have nowhere to go. They're out of their mind with grief. It was a they. Sounds like they recruited somebody. They did. The people who were their friends. Remember earlier on in the passage, in the story, it says, those who had hurt, who knew them, and were friends of theirs, acquaintances, and knew Lazarus, they came. It was a they. Many times it will take a they to conquer what's in front of you. It was a they that moved the, tomb, the stone for Lazarus to be able to walk out. Now it was the words of Jesus who called out, it's actually a scream. It's like an, you ever hear an animal just go nuts with crying out? That's what Jesus did. George talked about the snorting of a horse. And, you know, it's a great picture, but then it's a scream. And he screams, Lazarus, come out. And he came out. Still wrapped. Still wrapped. And what does Jesus say? Take, the, take off the wrapping. Take off the grave clothes. And who did that? The they. Be part of a they. Be part of your friends, the people in this room and in your community. Be the they for them. 
Be the people who are there when they're hurting. Be the they who then move the stone. Be the they who then unwrap the dead body that is now alive. Being part of this group is being part of a they. And as you leave here today, be part of a they. Be part of the, part of the healing of the people around us. Because God loves to use people just like you and me in mercy. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I think mercy was there and grace was great and free. Pardon is multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. I thank you, God, that there's no one between us and the cross. It's always just the one step ahead. And you always receive us just as we are, tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting and fear within and without. O oh, Lamb of God, we come, we come. As we approach Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, forgive us for being our own God, trying to solve it all ourselves when we can't. Let us lean on you, no matter how big, how small, because there's nothing too big for you. Thank you that you receive us. Always in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for coming. You are loved, and we will miss you desperately for the next two weeks. You all have a blessed Resurrection Sunday.